Hello and welcome to episode 19 of The Dive. We also have a special desk and reconfigured microphones. Parth, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. Sweet. <laughs> this is going to be I'm glad, an awesome episode. I'm glad you put some thought into this intro. Welcome, Parth. Uh, yeah, we have the same desk. I'm going to share my spot with you, though. Uh, one of the things we're obviously going to talk about this episode is going to be coaching-related topics so we can you know, use our expert guests here. Yeah, and we're going to talk about 716 as well as the upcoming promo tournament and then hit up some Twitter questions. Yeah, so I'm really glad you could join us this week. We've been trying to do this all split, but you always have scrims on Wednesday. And you said, if we get a playoff by... Yeah, TSM. Then you'd be able to do it. Yeah, man, your word, able to do it. So we're basically just going to talk about coaching this split. Uh, first topic we're going to do is kind of how the coach fits into their team dynamic, or how there could or could not be a rubric to kind of judge all coaches. Because a lot of people look at, hey, this coach is really good at pick and ban, or people speak highly of him. Kind of how do you particularly look at coaching? Is what we're going to start with. Sure. So I think overall, at least in my opinion, there's like four facets of coaching. Um, so there's like the game knowledge, which is something that most coaches have or build up as like they spend more time with players. They have like systems of how you want to organize the things that you want players to learn and how you prioritize like the things that you're working on. Then there's like the aspect of taking care of the players in terms of maintaining their physical and, and like mental well-being. And then you just have like your general authority and how much influence you have in like the organization over the players, etc. And I don't think there's any complete coach, at least in the West. I think there's a lot of teams that do like multiple coaches that sort of fills multiple roles. Um, So if you take like one giant rubric and try to like pigeonhole coaches in it, I don't think that really fits. You just have to look at each team as like an individual like entity Mm -hmm. and then see which coach fits in with that. Because there's some teams that need a lot more game knowledge if they have like rookies. Uh, Some teams have a lot of veterans and it just is easier if you just provide them structure. Um, And so I think every team does it differently. And right now I think it's um, a lot of coaches are trying to learn all the other facets. So I think that might change in like the upcoming seasons or years. But right now I think it's still fairly like new. So what I'd be curious to ask you is what do you think is essentially the most important part of, of that, right? You have this rubric. We talk about pick ban a lot. That's, I think, the outside looking in. That's the most obvious thing to kind of mm-hmm. judge yeah. coaching on. But then there's a, a lot to do with how can the players fit into that? What is their champion pool? So mm-hmm. do you think that pick ban is kind of the most important facet or what do you think is the most f- important for coaching? Uh, I think that when they started doing pick bans with coaches on stage, that's a responsibility that I think Riot wanted the coaches to have. I don't necessarily think that that is something that coaches should always do because sometimes all you need someone on stage is to take in like the information um, that's already presented in the pick band scenario and make a final decision. For my team, it happens to be me, but I'm pretty sure other teams, it's other players that know a lot more about the compositions they want to play or like can visualize what they want the game to plan to be. Because I know like, for example, Robert uh, Yip, he works on Immortals, and when Song was away, he was on stage. I mean, there's no way he was, like, giving his contributions to this pick band. There was, like, an, an assigned person. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it's the same with Lemon. Like, Lemon is a player who I think has more of a say in pick band than uh, their coach. But that doesn't mean that their coach doesn't contribute in a lot of different areas. So I think while initially pick band was a responsibility for coaches, uh, I don't think that that is, like, true as much anymore. Do you think yeah. there's an advantage to having the coach doing that over a player, though? Because to me, if, if a player gets tilted in the game and mm-hmm. then they're going into pick ban and they're the ones that have to do it, having an outside presence to be able to help with pick ban seems like it's it's pretty important. You know, someone who maybe is a bit more detached from the actual like emotions of the game. Yeah, of course. I think that if you can have someone that can take in a lot of like different opinions and make sure that they have a cohesive plan going forward and they make the last decision, it's probably better. But I don't think that, like say if um, a team, um, let's say TL for example, they're a team that would greatly benefit from having a very cohesive structure and someone who can help them with like their physical mental well-being because those are like the two facets of the, I think team that they've missed a lot in the last year. I would invest in that coach who doesn't do the pick ban over someone who does. So there are like different teams who need those things more. For me, I've always um, really respected coaches that 
aside from pick bands, like after they, they've chosen the compositions, um, can take the couple minutes before the team goes into the game to be like, remember this, you know, uh, they have Jarvan, he could come level two gank or whatever, like lay out the first five minutes, mm -hmm. um, taking into account what has happened in pick bands that the enemy has been able to get um, as well as what you've been able to get. Mm -hmm. um, like how, how many coaches in the league do you think um, tend more towards the side of kind of just like the little strategic reminders mm -hmm. or more towards um, like how many do we have that actually go, you know, super deep into whether it's analysts or themselves, um, the actual picks? Sure. So the, the minute that you have after pick band is over and mm -hmm. the game starts, I think all the coaches have to leave at five seconds. So that's something that you train during scrims because after the pick ban is over, you basically have a checklist that you go through. It's what where your early game plan is, what lanes are have pressure and what you want to be playing to. And then after, you always want to remember uh, what the win conditions of both comps are. And then last is how you want the team fights to go. Like if they're going to be flanking and if you're going to be team fighting like straight front to back, uh, these are all things, these four things you usually talk about in that minute. And then sometimes if you like recognize very specific game things, like if they have like Elise and a very snowboy champion top, you, you know that <laughs> that is going to be like a target of focus. So like any reminders that you can give them is really good. But usually the checklist of the other four things is practiced in scrims. So it's even if the coach isn't there, they can just prep the players to have that conversation too. Yeah, and it's interesting too because different players are going to be better at doing the checklist, right? You only have a certain amount of time to do it, then you're loading into the game, then you have your level one, and you kind of want your players to be able to do that. Yeah. And that's one thing that I feel like separates league coaches from other sports coaching is the fact that you don't have any say once you're in the game, yeah. right? It's just the five players. You look at pretty much any other sport, and there's heavy communication in between the game with the coach and the players. So it's, I say, a little bit more difficult for a coach to have that same level of influence that, like, an NBA or an NFL coach will do who's actually calling plays. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I'm always curious about is, like, if I was going to be trying to coach a League of Legends team, I look up to Phil Jackson or John Wooden or any of the other, like, big sports coaches. Mm -hmm. Is that something that a lot of NA coaches try and do? Like, have you read a bunch of books on coaching? Have you read biographies of other sports coaches? Or, like, what have you taken... Have you taken anything from traditional sports to try and implement into league? So a lot of the things that I learned are, or at least the books and lessons I learned were things that Weldon kind of brought to us, Last Split. Um, but I think the distinction between traditional sports and league is every traditional sport is split up into distinct segments where there's always a break, reset, and then you go back in. Like mm -hmm. tennis has games, sets. Um, I mean, football has like downs. Like everything has a a different reset period where coaches can interact with players. And so you can have a lot of burden on the coaches to like tell the players what you do or what they need to do. But with league, it's a continuous game. So enabling players is something that Weldon taught me is a lot more important than having the coach know what the right answer is and having to tell the players mm -hmm. that. So in a, in a case like that, you know, we talk about some player coaches. Lyra yeah. is a guy who's been kind of brought to the forefront a fair bit. People talk about Violet as a life coach and that Lyra is the one kind of teaching the team. At mm -hmm. least Paulo ha has credited that. So if you have a player like that, are you trying to basically work with him to make him your coach in game? Are you trying to have him be the guy that is constantly reminding the team during the game of these checklist points that, that you brought up? Is there anyone that, that you try to do that for? Sure. I mean, that that is one of the main responsibilities of shot calling in game, that he recognizes the win condition of the game and can like tell the other players to like adjust as the game goes on, depending on who's ahead, who's behind. Um, say you have like a very bot fake focused uh, team composition, but your top gets like insanely far ahead and we get first tower. Then obviously the way you shift resources to that lane in order to get like the easier win uh, is determined by the shot caller. Um, and so, yeah, I think, at least I believe that in league, since coaches can interact with players during the game, it is much better to enable the players to learn and like work with themselves. I do want to go back a little bit to your point of um, the the segments basically within uh, you know regular sports mm -hmm. versus League of Legends because yeah. now that we do you know best of series, um, we do have the breaks of in you know the games within a series. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that I've always been curious about because we don't get a lot of insight into what the coaches do you know during the the series, and we could just kind of have to speculate. Yeah. It's always been interesting to me teams that have like 
two junglers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Bengi um, and, you know, whoever Bengi is subbing with, uh, everyone was always like, okay, so he's sitting on in, in the back with Coma. And you get the benefit of watching this game. And so I always was like, oh, well, you know, he can probably, like, track the enemy jungler, you know, plant the route or whatever, and he'll come into the next game with, you know, more of a game plan, you know, more of a focus, mm -hmm. basically, uh, having watched the game with the coach. Do you feel like teams are, like, is that is that actually achievable to yeah. to utilize the sub like that? Because we say it a lot, um, yeah. and it kind of, like, theoretically makes sense, but practically... So oh, for jungler or support, the coach can tell him to give him that good shot call, but then it, it almost never seems to work that way. So a lot of teams, especially SKT, like if SKT is doing something, you want to learn from it. And that is like a vision that we had when we were looking for a sub AD. Um, it just happened that the process with Fnatic took too long. Um, and so we weren't able to like test that out in a meaningful way. So I'm not sure how much insight I have on how other coaches use subs, but that is something that we definitely want to try moving forward. And then maybe next time we have this conversation, I'll have like a, a more meaningful answer. Do you see Rale's, uh getting time? Um, <laughs> I mean, he, he isn't even here yet. Yeah. What happened is he went back and now, what initially we thought that when we went to Rift Rivals, we would sort of do the process like entirely there. And then he would come back and he'd be with us for like, the la latter half of the split and then playoffs. But if he's not even here yet and we're already starting playoffs prep, yeah. I don't see that as a super likely, at least for this playoffs. So how do you see subs fitting in uh, from the coach's point of view then? Should it be that you're just a different play style or should it be a different champion pool? Because to me, subs don't really make sense if you just have two guys that are kind of just playing the same thing in a similar way. One person probably going to be better and splitting time in that way doesn't really make sense. But where I do see it kind of making sense maybe in the future is if someone is really specialized at one type of champion, another guy's really specialized at another type of champion, then hey, maybe subs fit in to the game a little bit better. So, I mean, I think that's another thing that we wanted to try. I think if you can't really have two subs splitting equal time, mm -hmm. it has, at least in my opinion, it has to be one person who's told he's a starter, another person who's told he's a sub, and they work in tandem with each other and help each other improve unless like one person like fucks up immensely then the other person becomes a like gets his chance of being a starter um that's the only dynamic i see working and then in the case of like specializations i think that's what c9 ended up doing and i suspect that they ended up doing that because you couldn't have one person get like the entire champion pool so i think they specialized ray as like a very like a aggress aggressive non-tank People say that, but, but then he would come in and play Shen. Yes, but he <laughs> should. Like every like, if you are going to be using a sub and you put him in, everyone knows what you're going to do. And so if you don't occasionally play like those tank champions, then you're going to be like red like a book. So you have to be able to play the other champions, even if you are the sub. You can't just completely specialize. Yeah, I think it's tricky because we've had this discussion on the show before and like we even had it off the show where we're talking about are subs useless or not. At least that yeah. was Azale's assertion. And we generally kind of thought that, no, they aren't, but we haven't seen that many situations where a sub actually works for the better outside of just, we think this guy might be better than our current starter, so we are going to play him some of the time until we are playing him all of the time. I don't think that team, well, I do think subs are valuable, but the mm -hmm. value of those subs hasn't really been like tested and recognized yet. And every team is trying it in their own way. Yeah, and our theory of like where subs could work is if, you have a, a position that might have like a lot of shot calling duties or something, and then mm -hmm. you actually do watch it with a coaching staff yeah. of sorts, and then you can implement them in the next game. But yeah, not many teams have the players that are able to do that yet. So one question that I had for you, I'm reminded of a Twitter question we got last week, and or maybe it was it was a couple of weeks ago, but it was basically, do you? The question was, do you ever think that? Coaches would be allowed to talk in game, or should they? We all didn't think that they should be I able think to. That is a bad idea. What's What's your opinion on this? Do you think League of Legends would be made more competitive? Would be better if you were allowed to sit there behind the players in game and tell them, "Piercing, go top. Okay, Hanser, now you go mid." I do think that it would be. It would make the game a lot more competitive. As for whether I think they should implement that, I'm not really sure. I mean, it would just be like a different. I mean, your game. job would probably be a lot more important then. It'd be a lot more different. Yeah. Yeah. Like I would have to focus on a lot more different things. I maybe it wouldn't be me on stage. Maybe yeah. we would get like a player, a player specialist who does that. So, I would. I think it would definitely make the game more competitive. But I'm not sure if that's like the best addition. 
Kobe, do you have something to add about that? I was just going to bring up the point of would it even be Parth that, at that mm-hmm. point? Yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah. I, I, so. I would want a challenger player. Um, well, maybe not the challenger player. But like someone, <laughs> someone like High. That is like a role suited for High, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one thing you brought up earlier that I think is cool is talking about the different roles of different coaches because yep. people look at the League of Legends coach and we get one name. But I was just talking to you earlier about your MVP ballot and it's a coach that submits the award and you're like, oh, I was talking with our other coach and we were, you know, having trouble coming to a consensus. Yeah. So the size of the coaching staff varies wildly yep. between different teams. Some teams have like one life coach and then everyone else does all the strategy. You guys in the past have had five position coaches as well as yourself as a head coach. So I think a lot of times people don't appreciate uh, how much structure you can have, but also a lot of teams don't know what coaches they need or what works. Uh, I'm curious for you, like has position coaching worked out? Cause I know you're pretty hyped on that at the start of the year. Yeah. And I definitely think doing it is a lot better than not doing it because every player like approaches the game differently. And so in the time you have to do reviews, it's mostly dedicated to like team time, but you don't get to like pick out like the nitty gritty of lane or like the interactions in lane or the specific communication that you should have said every time. Like, let's say um, we're working on Kevin and he needs to like, every time he has a TP advantage, he's calling out what the window he has the TP advantage for. if I bring it up in review every time, it's not as impactful. But say in game, you have a position coach who every time he has TP up, he like reminds Kevin. Over a period of a week, Kevin now learns how to do this consistently. And like you it helps build habits and it helps like the individuals learn outside of like the team context. And so we can focus more on team things. So position coaching is valuable in that regard. Mm-hmm. I also thought it was really valuable and we started talking about that during our discussion of substitute players. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I thought, you know, maybe even if you had brought Raleigh's in and he was, uh, when he came in, he was told like 100%, you're just doing everything you can to make double lift better. Like you're not even a sub, you're the AD carry like um, specialist basically. Uh, do, what's the difference for you guys since you, the the release, the press release or whatever that you gave out uh, during when you picked up Raleigh's was like, oh yeah, he learned so much from how Double F plays and Double F learned so much from how he plays. He he's very clearly a sub and not a you know the AD carry you know specialist coach or whatever. What is the difference there for you guys? Um, I mean, he's definitely not a position coach. He's still a player yeah. that who like plays with the team. We still give him like some scrim blocks, um, and he does have a. Like he isn't he's a really good AD carry. I think he should be in the LCS right now. Um, he's a lot better than a lot of the AD carries right now. Um, the way so the like distinctions between players is like what champions they're willing to play, how fast they pick up the champions, what matchups they wanna like they prefer in terms of like going even, being ahead, um, and then just how they impact the game after laning phase in terms of what they bring in terms of shot calling and what they're willing to do for the team. And all those things are like Peter and um, Turtle had like very like differences in, which mm-hmm. is why I think we were gonna keep Turtle if he didn't want to go to FlyQuest. And it's the same thing. Those are like the similar differences that we see between him and Rallis. So there's definitely like um, it is. I think if you have a player who's like equal to you, but just has a very different opinion of how to view and play the game, then I think it is valuable for both players. Yeah. Cool. So something I, I was kind of curious about is, you know, you talk about having you know, position coaches and analysts and all these different people on the coaching staff. One thing that I always find shocking is when players do extremely inefficient builds, when players do <laughs> builds that just make no sense whatsoever mathematically within the context of the game. I mean, I, I'm thinking of one game earlier, this split, where I believe it was it was Lyra and it was versus, I want to say, a full AP team. He's building armor first, this sort of thing. Uh, or... You know, even Adaptive Helm, when it was mathematically a very poor item, we're seeing so many people building it. Mm-hmm. How do you guys deal with that sort of stuff? Yeah. When when patch changes come out, do you expect your players to actually figure stuff out themselves? Do you actually have an analyst who does the math and is, hey, don't buy this item, it's crap? Because to me, that's such an easy box to check for competitive teams. And I'm always shocked when top teams have players who are just building really inefficiently. Uh, I think it just depends on, like the staff and how they want to approach it. Like some st- staff- Well, how like, do you guys approach it? Like we don't like, look at it system- Like we don't look at it systematically in terms of item sets. Mm-hmm. We talk about more champions in general and everything else is more down to the position coaches of the players. And maybe if that week they aren't really like, if you're, say like Pearson has like an idea of 
like what to build on a champion mm -hmm. already, right? He's not going to tell like Sev, his position coach, to go look up new item builds for him to do. And then Sev will be focusing on a lot of other aspects. And then on stage, he'll go on and find, oh, this is maybe not the most efficient build. Then they'll like come back. But we don't really have a systematic way of looking at like maximizing item sets as of yet. Do you think that's kind of a failing then? Because to me, when an item comes out of it, it is just straight up inefficient. Obviously, there's there's play style things, and then that's a bit different in building Umbrellas first, or Manchis first, or whatever. But yeah. you know, if it's building when Adaptive Helm first came out, if it's building that versus Spirit Vistage, Spirit Vistage was basically better in every single case. So, yeah. so do you think that that's something that you guys need to fix then? Uh, potentially. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I've Maybe. seen players build the wrong Quint uh, Mark setup for that attack too. speed and attack damage. And that's been the same way for a year and a half. So... I, I think it's a failing somewhere in the overall system. It's like system. the free throws the of League of Legends, right? It's like, yeah. why don't people practice it? Some people just have bad wrists. Shaq couldn't shoot <laughs> free throws. He said it's because he broke his wrist when he was a kid. Oh, man. Uh, so two more things we want to touch on with you, Parth. One of them is patching and patch cadence. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a discussion I kind of have internally all the time if I'm talking with the balance team. And I'm always under the impression that uh, pro teams generally want as small number of changes as possible or the fewest disruptions uh, mm -hmm. to the meta. Versus there are things that get frustrating, they get stale, and adaptation also wants to be a skill test that pro teams have to go through. So it's kind of balancing all of those things together. Uh, I know we've had plenty of discussions about this in the past. Like last year, lane swaps, yeah. getting swapped when they did was too late in the game. And that degraded the game quality a little bit towards the finals, but I still think it was a good call overall because Worlds was a much better experience because of it. Uh, just... Do you have any additional thoughts on this conversation or what's been happening this year? Sure. So, I mean, there's two facets of that. The first one is it depends on the scale of what's being changed in the patch. So, for example, uh, most teams, when they start off this, like the season, they have first, like, mechanics is always, like, the most important thing. After mm -hmm. that is the fundamentals of the game, like, what the game state is currently. Like, if there's, is there a herald? Is that, like, an important objective? Because that changes how you play the first, like, 10, 15 minutes of the game versus if there isn't a Herald. Mm -hmm. If lane swaps are viable or if there aren't. That, like, shapes the fundamentals of how you play the game. After that, it ends up being, like, high-level strategy, um, how you take those fundamentals and make sure you have, like, a communication system built around those just so, like, the first 15, 20 minutes are pretty straightforward in terms of what you want to do. Because the goal for every pro player... Or, or staff is to make sure that when you go on stage, you are executing at like the highest level possible. So when you see a change in patch in terms of disruption, um, you have to adapt. And the more you adapt, the less time you have to invest in uh, working on like execution um, of like, say like, if you have like a certain subset of champions say, and then you are just playing with that subset for like a month, you're gonna be executing at a very high level but it might be boring for the fans. But if you change the patch, then you're going to have a different uh, subset of champions. You might need to learn more. So it might be more interesting to the fans because you have more champions that are being played, mm -hmm. um, but the players might not be as comfortable on all those champions. So the trade-off is you are every time you change the game, either the fundamental state of the game or the champions that are being played, um, the amount of time that you're going to be spending adapting to finding the new, like, most optimal game state is the time you're taking away from the teams trying to maximize their level of execution. Mm -hmm. And at least I think what Riot did this split and last split is pretty good, where they had, like, the big patch in the middle of the split, and then they kind of stabilized as it went to playoffs. Because you can test the, like, ability to adapt in the middle of the split. Um, to a certain degree, not like lane swap level big, but like mm -hmm. you can just throw a bunch of like random champions that are tanks being getting yeah, like big. tanks, yeah, assassin yeah. update, stuff, stuff like that. Um, but at least during playoffs, where like it matters a lot, I think that the level of execution that the teams can like do should be the highest metric for the teams that go on. So I'm curious, how highly, when you're looking at a player, do you rate adaptability? How important is to you that your players can play everything can quickly switch from an assassin to a control mage, you know, back and forth, things like this, because people talk a lot about that, you know, from the caster, from the narrative point of view, mm -hmm. uh, adaptability is something that is constantly tested with these players. Is it more important to have someone who's extremely good and focused in, in one area, but maybe less adaptable? Or do you want the jack of all trades? I think there's some misconception in terms of adaptability. It's mm -hmm. not just the player's ability to play like the new style of champion on a mechanical level. It's 
how that changes, like how the other four players play around that too. Let's say you are shifting. Split pushers. Yeah, like let's say you're shifting from like a tank meta to a bruiser or a split push meta. The entire way you play the first 10 minutes of the game is drastically different because now you have to focus a lot more on top side and making sure that this like super fragile champion isn't fucked because then you're just going to lose that game off of that. So you're saying it wasn't Rush's fault that he couldn't play tanks. It was everyone else's fault that Rush couldn't play tanks. <laughs> I mean, we, you don't know. You don't know yeah. if it was like he didn't want to play tanks or if the team recognized that he couldn't play tanks and decided to not. So you can never blame, mm -hmm. or at least I believe that you can't really blame a player for not picking up something that's meta. Yeah, and I know before he came on the show, um, just so people are wondering why we're not like grilling Parth on TSM questions, he doesn't want to give away any like TSM strategy and he's going to end up taking off uh, before the patch discussion because that strategy elements for playoffs. But I would love to get a little insight on what you say to people that uh, accuse TSM of being bad at adapting. Uh, because I've definitely been one of those people. Uh, sure. You got flamed for Jax and Zareth on 7.15 when it was all about tanks and other stuff. You got flamed for Galio too. and that's You got like flamed for Galio at the start. Picked a, do, do you agree that TSM is slow at adapting or bad at adapting? Or how do you see that conversation panning out? Sure. I mean, I don't think the players or staff really care about what, like, the people outside of the org are saying in terms of like what our adapting adaptability is. Uh, we have a structure of how we approach every change. And sometimes we end up picking up Galio or Trist when it's ahead, um, mm -hmm. of like ahead of when everyone else does. And it's good. Sometimes when Chogath and Maokai are super strong and we recognize we don't think it's as strong, like we were still playing Maokai that weekend. It's mm -hmm. just we didn't have as high priority on it. And so sometimes it just falls through the cracks and you lose the game. Um, and we just think it's fine. Um, I do agree that we're not as liberal in terms of just testing out a lot of new champions because some teams, when they look at a new patch, they say, let's just try a lot of new things and then we will find like something that's super strong. But when teams are doing that, they're sacrificing maintaining what they're already trying to do. Uh, whereas we try to have like a dual structure where we try to maintain what we're already working on, but also try to test that against all the new things that are being played. So sure, maybe sometimes it'll take us slightly longer to pick up on the new stuff, but I believe in the structure more so than I do at just trying all the random changes that have happened and hoping that the thing that we picked up is strong enough to justify not practicing all the meta stuff during the time. So what is what is your process then for for bringing in these new picks? Is it okay, you know, Hanser? Oh, you want to try this pick? Well, practice it in solo queue. Then and once you're really good on a solo queue, then it goes to scrims. Then if it's really good in scrims, then it goes to stage. Or can you just pop in and he says, yeah, I think Fiora is good here, and we'll just play it. Uh, it's very player based. Um, some players will want a certain amount of practice on something before they want to test it. Like Bjergsen has like his very own like unique system of how it decides what's good and what's not. Some players just say that, oh, I saw this once, I'm pretty sure I can mechanically play it, let's try it today. Um, so then um, we talk about this during the meeting as a team, because most of the structure just goes towards, uh, should, do we want to invest time in this? And it's not like completely democratic, but at least a lot of players have a say in what everyone else is doing, because when you are picking like a new champion, it affects the other four players as well. So. Um, what was the original question was um, just how they pick it up, right? It, yeah, it, it's, it's very private. Process. Let's use Zareth. Well, why don't we use an example of Zareth, right, for, for Bjergsen? Because he, after you guys used Zareth one time, he, he, I think he tweeted out that, like, oh, I've been practicing for a while. You know, we thought it was good here. Um, is that, a, like, a special to be pick where you guys would pick it into a specific situation or yeah, use that as the, the example basically no no comment. or no okay let's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. nice try kobe uh all right oh, so we're gonna be moving on to lck in a little bit to talk about lck playoffs because we all follow it and that'll be really cool right before we do that though uh since we are doing a coaching themed episode what do you see as the difference between korean coaches and na coaches because everyone has their theory of why korea is better than na it's cultural it's because they play best of threes it's because they respect their coaches more uh, what is the cultural or coaching difference you see from the LCK coaches versus here in NA? Um, I mean, first, at least Korea has a much larger player base than us, which yeah. is like number one. Number two is since they have a lot bigger player base, uh, a lot of the players are more easily replaceable. And so their work ethic is just ends up being more. I think at least for players in Korea, I don't see the same like, um, not need, but they don't seem to want as much work-life balance 
like as much as NA players do. Uh, they're willing to grind out like 16 hour days and work like insanely hard because they know that if they slack off, they are going to be easily replaced. Whereas that's not really as true in NA. Even some orgs are super in favor of having work life balance and making sure that their players are comfortable because I don't think that the players that they have or the rosters that they have can be like challenged or replaced as easily. So I think the first thing it comes down to is the players. Um, I think that the coaches do play a part because just the way that they've worked with coaches um, in the last 10 years has been a lot more prevalent in Korea. Whereas here, every coach sort of comes in from like their own angle. Like I have like my own experiences leading up to when I started working with TSM. So did Weldon, so did Tony. Um, so did um, someone like Cop and Saint. Like mm -hmm. everyone has their own perspective and we're still trying to figure out how to best coach in like the ecosystem that we have. Yeah, so in that case, are you saying there's more of a uh, rubric for what a coach should be in Korea versus NA is much more like Wild West, everyone brings their own layer? Because that is one thing that happens more in pro sports. The youngest coaches are 35 or 50 because they've been through it all before and they have a system in place, whereas there's no coaching infrastructure that was set up prior to three years ago in NA. Yeah, so I mean, we can go into the like discussion about like the coach of the split award, right? Sure. Because yeah. I think that... There's a lot, like this award, I don't think has a lot of at least meaning to the people that receive it. Like when I got it, I didn't tell anyone and like the players just find out and I was kind of embarrassed about it because I don't think that I had the contributions to merit like an award of that stature because it is being voted on by people who don't know what I do for the team. It is mm -hmm. voted on by like assumed metrics for everyone where they don't even know what the metrics are outside of oh, this guy shows up on a camera a lot and people say this team is good. Sometimes it's like, oh, this team is doing really well, so let's just award the coach. So I feel like that award loses a lot of meaning to me because it's voted by people who don't know what the coach does with metrics that they don't understand. Yeah. Um, and every coach provides something different for each team. I have a follow-up question. Um, which of the coaches in the North American LCS um, do you have the most respect for? And of the four, basically, um, you know, aspects of coaching that you talked about at the beginning of the interview, um, do you think that they maybe do better than you or, or are strongest at? Um, I think, and I've, like, this is the person I've voted for, like, every year since I've been able mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Uh, it's Tony. I think he is the only person who I think Zix that... for people who... Yeah, Zix, CLG's um, for CLG's coach. Um, he is. Um, he has a lot of game knowledge, and he's built that over the last few years. And he also understands structure, which I like. Those that combination I haven't seen in most other teams. You can usually see when you're like playing them uh, in scrims or on stage mm -hmm. what they've been working on that week. It's like very apparent. Like they have a structure of how they want to approach things and what they want to do. And it's usually guided by really good assumptions because he usually identifies like the things they need to change and fix pretty easily. Um, I actually have a really funny story about Tony. Um, Hit us in, up. What? Do it. Well, I mean, I actually don't think he even knows this. Uh, <laughs> in 2015 is when I first came to, like, working with TSM on site mm -hmm. um, during the summer split. Uh, there was, like, some Twitch party, and then I ended up going because people, like, invited me. Uh, and I saw someone who know, knew him, and I asked uh, him if they knew where Tony was because I wanted to talk to him. And they were like, oh, he's just sitting in ho home grinding bods. And that's where like, I started to respect him a lot, where it was like, wow, why am I at this party when he's still at home like working and he could be here? <laughs> so after that, it's like... No more I, parties. I, I like look... That. I mean, I look up to his like, work ethic, right? Coach. I thought this story was going a completely different <laughs> yeah. direction, oh, no, by no, the yeah. way. When he's like, I have a really funny story. Yeah, I was it at starts a at a Twitch party. <laughs> no, 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 no. I do have a lot of really have a funny, funny story. story of Kobe at a Twitch party. That's how I met Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> he was at home grinding bots. Yeah. <laughs> no. But yeah, like, no, after... Good. Yeah, it's funny. like... Yeah, that's exactly... Yeah. It's like, after that point, I was like, if I want to be, like, respected as a coach or someone who works with the mm -hmm. team, it's I need to make sure that... Yeah. yeah, you just have to work harder than everyone else. And it's true. That type of stuff is never going to get seen on, like, a coach of the split ballot. I do yeah. want to just jump back to that real quick, though, because uh, I think that to a certain extent, not having the same criteria or seeing the whole picture is true for every award. True. Like, 
voting I mean, for it's, all it's, LCS, but it's carry or something, right? shot calling, they, like Lira, for instance, a lot of people have given him votes because other people have said he's been the coach of the team. So you're always working with available information. And even if I'm moving it to like a different sport where there's 32 different teams that play 82 game seasons, the people voting haven't seen more than 5% of the games from every team. So I, I think all of these things are inherently flawed. So uh, I think people should do their best to like at least find out a little bit more about coaches. I didn't like it when it's just the number one team gets it every single split, yeah. unless you have like a really good reason and you've heard a lot of good things. But uh, I agree, it's really hard to find information about coaching. I still like the award though. My question for you would be, do you have an idea of how you think a better way to kind of appropriately award these coaches would be? Sure. Um, I mean, the only thing I can think of is there are teams where the coach is more valuable to the team than say like other teams. For example, mm -hmm. I think um, like Tony brings more to CLG than I bring to TSM. I think that the combination of Robert Yip and Song bring a lot more to Immortals um, than like Reaper does to C9. Yeah. And that's like super subjective and it's hard to like see if like the coaches aren't like super in the front yeah. forefront talking about what they do. And I but, try and look at it as like coaching staff of the split for what it's worth. Yeah, so yeah. when I voted for you back when you had like you and Weldon, you were listed as the head coach. So I'm yeah, like, oh, yeah. TSM gets coaching staff. Of the split. But if you guys can allow writings, it'd be pretty good because mm -hmm. then it would allow for like a lot more staff to be involved. Yeah. Cause, a, cause, so you think it should be a staff vote, basically? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It is always so difficult for me to come up with mine, cause, and mine always end up being super biased by my personal experiences. Because as you said, mm -hmm. it's so difficult for us to find out what the coaches do, because you don't want to give away uh, your secrets or you know yeah, any yeah. things you're practicing on. Um, so mine always end up being like, you know, oh, I was over at X team's house, and you know, got a very small <laughs> window into you know one interaction where you know a coach was you know teaching the team about something or disciplining someone like that. And that's where I feel like a lot of variability in the, um, you know, votes would come from. It's also, as you said, super subjective. And you yeah. know, even as a coach, I imagine you don't have insight into every single team's yeah, other coaches, right? So, yeah. so even the coaches can't really maybe do the votes perfectly, yeah. uh, even voting for your peers. It's also one of the complications for me that's always very difficult is I do think drafting is very important, but I don't always have insight into, okay, well, you didn't pick Maokai for Hanser. Well, is it because Hanser can't play Maokai? Or is it because you didn't think Maokai was good? Or is it because yeah. Bjergsen yeah. wanted him to play a split pusher? Or is it because, you know, there's all these different layers to it that make it very hard to even judge coaches on drafting. Yeah. So all these things are why I, that is, for me is, is the hardest one to vote for. All that being true, I do think that coaches should take a, a lot of responsibility for the team's failures over the players because ultimately regardless of how they fit into the team's like dynamic they are ultimately responsible for what happened to that team so like say when like we go to international tournaments i should be more responsible than the players for things that go wrong do you think the same even if it's say violet who is you know, the players have essentially said is, is kind of like a life coach and he's not doing the drafting. If the team's drafts suck, is it still ultimately his responsibility? I mean, it depends on like... Yeah, it depends if he's supposed to be a facilitator as well. Yeah. 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 Right? And Again, I, I think subjective. you want a yeah. head coach that is able to assume that level of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to Korea though because hype playoffs coming through. Longju got the number one seed. Uh, first playoff match is going to be between SKT and Africa Freaks. But basically... It's a four-horse race, we think, with three spots. So it's still Longju, KT Rolster, Samsung Galaxy, and SK Telecom T1. But Hot SKT takes. Still has to, what they still have to play Africa. And, and yeah? Africa actually 2-0'd SKT last time they played. And SKT you know, went to three games the first time they played. So you still can't even say that that's a guaranteed win. I mean, SKT has not done that well against a lot of the teams that they're going to have to be playing in the gauntlet. I mean, the first the first series you could say you know is a better win record for Africa. I believe they lost both their games against Samsung 2-0 as well. So it's it's going to be tough. It definitely is. And you know the the meme about can SKT still make worlds actually could have the wrong answer uh, <laughs> pretty quickly here. You know, they have to beat Afrika and they have to beat Samsung. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to qualify on points. On points. Yeah. Um, so, like, this, especially to me, the the game, if they do beat Afrika uh, versus Samsung, is going to be super hype because Samsung have a lot to gain there, too, because then they could get in if, uh, you know, SKT don't um, because they're taking away a lot of their points. 
It is pretty crazy, though, to think that SKT, you know, might not even make it near to the finals because they have actually I won four of the last five splits, I believe, in in Korea, and they've won mm-hmm. something like six of nine since they entered, maybe six of ten, and three of the but, last four worlds. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it, it is pretty crazy. You know, I, I would be kind of interested in your opinion. Obviously, a lot of people try to learn from Korea. Do you think that SKT has gotten worse, or the uh, Korea as a region has gotten better and has kind of risen to their level? You know, it, are people in a position where they should be more scared of Korea going to Worlds or, or less? Uh, I don't think the level of Korea has gotten better. I do think that KT and Longju, they didn't have a, very much of an identity in the spring, but they've like discovered that they split. And while SKT sort of had their slump, and I think it's because partly because of, I think Huni and Wolf, I guess they're top and Wolf. They've been trying a lot of, like, if you look at their picks, they aren't, like, generally what everyone considers to be good anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that SKT should have a stronghold going into playoffs as long as they don't drop the best of three to Africa. Because best of three is a lot more random yeah. and volatile. But once, if they do end up getting through, I do think that SKT should be as strong as contender as any other of the other three teams. Yeah, this is kind of a little off topic, um, but you might have some insight on streaming. Because I know TSM has really popular streamers still, even if they don't stream that much. Mm-hmm. And recently, SKT, like this year, signed the streaming deal with Faker streaming a lot. That's the one you see because he's the most popular. But Bang and kind of all their players mm-hmm. have a lot of streaming hours now. The work ethic you talked about before, practicing all the time every day, is that hurt now with SKT streaming? Is that something that could be a little bit for their decrease in success? I don't know how much they stream, but if they do stream a meaningful amount, I know that what will be a meaningful amount of streaming that could detract from prep or scrims. Let's or say you're like scrimming for six hours plus have like two or three hours of meetings mm-hmm. or like reviews. Then that's like nine hours. Um, then you have maybe three or four hours to play solo queue per night without like burning out from like a Western perspective. And you feel like know. if you're streaming versus playing solo queue. Yeah, if you're like playing four or five hours, if you're playing streaming like four hours or five hours a night, that would definitely be detrimental to mm-hmm like SKT's performance for sure. I know that Faker always has a ton of solo queue games, Mm -hmm. but playing solo queue games on stream is a lot different. Is a lot different. I feel like it's not as valuable as like him actually just going into solo queue and like trying to concentrate. Unless he's like completely non-interactive with everything that's going on and he's just putting the camera on and just playing everything normally. I'm pretty sure most people when they stream are pretty active with. Yeah. Yeah. He's a little interactive, but... Even subconsciously, I think that it, it's one of the things where you're in front of an audience mm-hmm. now, right? Yeah. You're maybe more concerned about how you're sitting, how you're looking, what you're doing, you know, if you're doing something silly or not. If you're if you're losing, I think a lot of players get way more tilted if they're yeah. getting smashed on stream than if they're maybe getting smashed and no one is watching yeah. it. I mean, having streamed myself, it's way more tiring than playing off stream. Yeah. It, I think it fatigues you. The, pe- the players like Sneaky that are able to stream that long, like, I... It's super I impressive. don't know how he does it. And some people, to be fair, actually just love it, right? Yeah. Some people are energized by it. Some people are super, super <laughs> excited to it. And other people are doing it maybe more as a means to an end, right? To build their brand, to be able to have something that they can turn to after after pro gaming. So I think it has super yeah. different uh, implications. But anyway, we should probably yeah. get back anyway, more to Korea players. Exactly. Streaming aside, Longju, KT Rolster, Samsung, SKT. Can we pick a favorite for the playoffs, right? Because Longju getting the number one seed was a surprise to me. Uh, they won a game tiebreaker with KT Rolster. They both ended the split 14-4. and four. Uh, But as you mentioned, they did find their identity. Prey and Gorilla, I feel like the rest of the map started playing well around them, right? And then their success bottom lane could work really well. BDD had a career split. Uh, Cuz worked well in the jungle. Khan is super strong top lane. Like Looking at that team, you don't actually find a lot of weaknesses. But I did see, I believe it was BDD had an interview, mentioned how he would hope... Uh, to have a less experienced team in the final. So I'm wondering if the nerves are going to hit him there. Yeah, to me, that's... Um, and I absolutely love Longshu, uh, this split. Yeah. Um, super, super... You were hyping him up like a month and a half ago. I know, I was saying that they were going to get through. They were going to be mm-hmm. the third team. Um, but I do uh, recognize their weaknesses. You know, uh, not only um, the relative less experience of, uh, you know, Khan and BDD and these guys, even though they had played before, but Cuz... Um, Cuz is definitely a pure rookie, and you know I mm. love his solo queue and everything. But um, like you're saying, you know, as you, as you get to these higher pressure maps, they actually even had interviews, uh, like you talk about, from these guys that are like, 
we definitely fear the more experienced, you know, guys because these are best of fives, like these are high pressure situations, and I could see that being a problem. I even think that for a less experienced team, waiting in the finals for the hardest match can be actually a disadvantage than sometimes yep. uh -huh. playing the way through because it, you can build confidence against maybe Africa or someone who's perhaps an easier match for them than whoever will meet them in the finals, right? And when you're sitting there and you're getting more and more nervous the closer it's getting and there's a long time off before they actually play, I think that can work against a lot of teams. And, and I know I always wanted to play matches leading up to, to the final day because for me, that was something that... Uh, built confidence in they don't play you. until august 26th yeah it's a long time i would actually say that of all the teams i would least likely think that longju would win and even though they have to win one best of five yeah but it's that's crazy africa is Frank more Gorilla likely though. to win than longju okay i was i didn't even <laughs> I, we're oh, talking about, about the, the four. other four the okay, four okay, that we were okay, talking okay. about it's also because when you're, you're giving them the kobe envy treatment it doesn't even count <laughs> the them. kobe envy. oh my god <laughs> um i actually think that if you look at Longju and KT, they have like the best early games in the league for the most part. But the way they, they get those leads is drastically different. Whereas KT is a lot more methodical. Uh, Longju, he just, they just have Cuz um, do a lot of random things. So normally Cuz is just super far behind or even at best with the enemy jungler. But he sets his laners up ahead. And I don't think that that's a consistent strategy if you're going to playoffs against best of fives where yeah. all the teams are just going to be prepping for you. It works in the regular season, but like I think that the way they get leads early game is not going to be as consistent. And then even after you always going into playoffs or international tournaments, um, bet on the teams that are more established or orgs that are more established because yeah. they just have a lot more experience in dealing with these situations. I can kind of say the same thing with KT Rolster. Like, I agree with the points you say about Longju, but I look at the way KT Rolster plays, and every time it's them versus SKT, it's, like, totally two stylistically different things. KT's yep. trying to snowball lanes and win the game early, and then SKT is going to play team fighting and win late game. And it's almost like the same transition between scrims and stage is between regular season and super hype matches in the playoffs. You're going to be less likely to pull the trigger on an early game goal lead and snowball into victory, which is, I think, one of the reasons KT historically kind of loses down the stretch or at least this team in particular because they try and play so fast so i'm wondering now if they've finally played enough of these high pressure games where they're going to be able to not slow down on the big stage yeah. uh, other than that though like there's no there's no strong bet in this which is i think what makes it so exciting pick your favorite x rocks tiger uh members here or ku tiger members praying it's gorilla. like they're all they're all trying to climb up to the top to meet praying gorilla this time yeah yeah even curl man a freak of freaks uh -huh. he's gonna win ahead of all of them uh -huh. Wait, you have a favorite that you, that you think will i was actually win. about to ask you guys <laughs> i would want samsung to win i you favorite. want them to win why i like the way they play i like the structure with how they approach the game it's not as like snowball as kt but they still have mm -hmm. like a good plan of what they want to do early but they also play like mid to late game really well i think they're just the most solid team out of this they're like somewhere between like kt and skt for me i definitely want to go kt that's what i, was, I want to do KT. i want to oh, see i want to see score say, baby i want to cash some score <laughs> at worlds I, you never bet on kt right you're <laughs> never supposed to get excited about kt and you're never supposed to bet against skt and kt already lost to best of three like a week ago to SKT. And they lost the other one earlier in the season. They're, they're 0-2 to SKT. But, they just, but I think they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just think they, they just need Samsung to beat. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're hoping that Samsung yeah. is the bodyguard because Samsung has been doing better against SKT. <laughs> I, I also think, you know, although it kind of sounds boring in, in the big picture of things, SKT always wins. I, I always am excited by that because I think that consistency is so ridiculously impressive and the fact that they keep winning is so ridiculously impressive because people talk about, oh, well, the patch changes, make things hard for our same team to stay consistent. Well, this this changes, the players change, all these different factors. And if you can mm -hmm. continually win time and time again in the most competitive league amongst roster changes, amongst you know staff changes, amongst all the patch changes, that to me is just so impressive. And SKT has established that level of dominance. So although you know seeing a SKT win again would not be something new, it's still exciting for me. I think SKT winning would definitely be the biggest accomplishment because mm -hmm. if you are winning for such a long time, all the other teams in the world look up to you. Mm -hmm. And like you're being like copied, you're mm -hmm. like being studied you're being the entire time. Um, like that happens to us sometimes like here where teams will just do things drastically different against us than what we expect. Like mm -hmm. I think we played FlyQuest and our prep was 
something along the lines of Lemonation doesn't pick Thresh, and their Thresh priority is just suddenly super high against us. Like, things like that, I think SKT faces a lot of, where a lot of the things that they have to play against, or the strategies that they have to pra or play on stage against, aren't things that they expect, because everyone is trying to do a different thing against them to beat them. Yeah. And that's, it's impressive if they can keep winning after that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why everyone always talks about going back to back or repeating as a champion is so hard because every single time you play against a team, you're getting their best and you just have to constantly be on your guard, right? And yep. it's, it's harder to repeat than it is the first time. Uh, but we're going to be moving on to the patch soon. You're going to hop off. Is there any final things you, you want to say? Stage. Part? Tell us all your thoughts on the patch. Yeah, tell us what champions Let's get back to that Zareth, though. <laughs> yeah. There's some secrets. <laughs> yeah, Zareth is broken. He's going to be first picked every game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, there you go. Thanks yep. so much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Maybe we can do it again sometime. All right, let's talk about the patch then. 7.16 is coming out to live, and this has a bunch of competitive changes. Whole bunch for mid laners, mm -hmm. and they also touched on some of the highest uh, you know, presence champions that we have in Caitlyn and Maokai as well. Yeah. Hoping to balance some of these picks that we've just been seeing a bunch of. Yeah, anytime we look at these patches, I think the focus was mid lane world balance. I think one of the important things to note with the mid lane balance for worlds is they identified this pack of mid laners mm -hmm. that were kind of, in their opinion, above all the other mid laners. If you look at the presence statistics as mm -hmm. far as pick ban, kind of worldwide, I think that's true. And then the point was to hit them all a little bit so that you might get a few more that creep up there and not to really kill any of these. I agree with the goal and I think most of these changes hit that note, but I think one champion that was hit too hard would have been Oriana. Uh, I think taking 20 damage off of the shield at all ranks uh, changing, I'm not really sure how the, the buffering works on QW and how precise that's going to be, but then also taking damage off of the W at all ranks. I think this is more than the other mid laners were hit by, by a pretty big margin. I do agree that the numbers, because it's not just the shield, they also nerfed the damage on dissonance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the least impactful is the QW mm -hmm. change. Um, yeah, because, I'm just not sure how it's going to play out. Yeah, uh, at the pro level, I think that's going to have actually zero impact. I, I think they're good enough to get it off in a smaller duration. Mm -hmm. But I, as you said, just the, f the flat numbers do seem damage. a bit bigger than the others. It was an 80 shield, and now it's a 60 shield. And I think you leave that at rank one until level 14. So that's I think that's going to add up really fast. That's one of Oriana's main trading benefits. Yeah, at the same time, she's been such a generalist and she's blind picks so many times. She's fits into basically every composition. And I, mm -hmm. I used to always kind of feel that Oriana was more of this, this champion that had to get to late game. And it's been feeling more and more as I've been watching it over the last couple of months that Oriana's just kind of pretty good whenever. Yeah. And feels like there's not really a wrong time to Call ever this one pick her. the Apto nerf. <laughs> so yeah. I, I just think it's, it's it kind of makes some sense that it's, it's getting more of a nerf. Hopefully this doesn't delete it completely. But... You know, every champion to me should be more situational. And, you know, I was looking at some of the numbers that you're talking about as far as the highest presence champions getting hit, right? Mm -hmm. So Cassiopeia, Corky, Galio, LeBlanc, Ori, Syndra, and Talia are the ones that all got nerfed that are mainstays and competitive. On 715, the champion that is not them that got the most picks is actually three, and it was Lucian. So that yeah. is the most picked after that. Is and this then, in NA or like... This is worldwide in 715. From like Games of Legends or something? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're looking at this summer as a whole, then you're starting to get down into some of the champions that you, we might be seeing a lot more of. Uh, Kassadin was the highest presence after mm -hmm. that. Then there's Victor, Karma, Ari, Vlad. So to me, that's the sort TF of stuff. Here. Yeah, there's there's stuff that I'm looking at. Well, and they weren't super high presence, so I'm just looking yeah. more at presence, right? But when you look at the champions that were not hit and that were already considered quite good, those are the ones that to me are most likely to then jump up and maybe uh, make a resurgence or, or kind of pop up again, like you talked about TF and his year. Mm -hmm. So that's what's kind of interesting for me. I'm hoping that the, the nerfs are not big enough to knock these guys out completely, but they are big enough to push more in there because anytime there's a bigger range of champions that can be picked, I enjoy watching the game more. Yeah, I think stuff like the Talia nerf uh, could be big, but I think mostly it's just going to make her more situational. Mm -hmm. Like I think most of these hit right. I think Talia now has to go Morel and Omicron, can't go the Banshee's Veil build. 
Kobe, is there one that stands out to you for mid lane, or do you want to touch? Uh, on I was game? super curious about the uh, LeBlanc shatter because when you when they start to nerf AOE things like that, for wave clear mm -hmm. of champions, there's such a clear breakpoint, right? Mm -hmm. it, do you if you still have enough damage to actually kill off the minions, depending on oh, you know, LeBlanc usually has like one kill by this point, so you have an extra tome or something like that, then uh, it's it's not very impactful. If you hit that breakpoint of oh my god, the range minions have five life each left yeah. after my combo, then it could completely changes the champion yeah that kind of so. happened to galio actually after the the doran's ring nerfs right where your q could essentially it was harder to hit the break point to one shot the back line and those are so big especially for a champion that already has poor or at least dangerous wave clear for leblanc yeah, yeah. Uh, another champ hit caitlin is she dead Good. no Ka caitlin got hit a lot man the passer damage on q down from 67 percent beyond the first to 50 percent beyond the first and then yordle snap trap uh, which most people used as a secondary max. Occasionally would max it before maxing other spells, so you'd max it around like level 11 or 13. Uh, still I, the best because she can bully the lane. I, I don't think, I think that she's, she's down. I don't think she's necessarily the best, but I don't think changes like these take you from highest priority to dead, right? Mm -hmm. So it'll be probably more situational. Maybe it doesn't have to be a permaban every time. That is something that, I, that I'm hoping to see, but... These are not changes of the magnitude that just delete her from competitive. And I like that because this is actually the second one. The The previous patch, they took her attack speed a bit mm -hmm. down. Um, so they're taking kind of the the, the thousand cuts approach. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that is good. I like as, it way more. As we were just talking about with Parth, um, you know, yeah. leading up to playoffs and stuff um, and four worlds. And we have been, you know, uh, also working with those guys. So I think Aelin actually is is going to be in a pretty good spot. I'm super hyped, actually, because I'm more interested in the Callista tristana Sivir triangle, where mm -hmm. uh, Sivir can spell shield Tristana stuff really easily, you know, pretty good into that matchup. Uh, tristana can do the explosive shot, uh, you know, trades onto Callista. Mm -hmm. Callista is good into Sivir because your yeah. rend is really hard to predict and you can't uh, get that one out. So, like, to me, there's all these little uh, matchup interactions between those three, which I see really rising up, especially with Kaylin coming down. And they were already um, those three kind of yeah. battling it. And then out. I see Kogma too, right? So, and I think Kogma, I, I think we saw last week was pretty hard priority. There were some teams that were banning out five AD carries. But then I still saw good AD carries pop up after that, right? You'd still be able to play Twitch or something, or even Bears that was pretty good. So my one fear would be that that role is actually just a little OP right now. But mm -hmm. aside from that, I'm pretty happy with, with these changes. Kobe, Vi got buffed. I'm always <laughs> excited about Vi buffs. I, I, I was super excited. I also, because um, uh, I always am, am looking at the patch notes as they're developing them mm -hmm. on for PBE and stuff. They had more Vi buffs in there, and I was what? super juiced, but they took some of, some of the extra ones out. Um, and, and these ones, I am super happy for, you know, more cooldown uh, reduction on her ultimate. But um, to me, the, the nerfs, why I actually stopped playing her so long ago after, you know, playing Vi straight for like years, um, where the continued nerfs to her move speed and yeah. um, and damage on the ult. Uh, the cooldown is going to be great, and I am going to be playing her again, but um, I'm curious to see. I might actually just be going Swifty Boots um, most games to to deal with the move speed. Have you ever tried MS Quince and stuff like that for her? Um, I I really dislike taking MS Quince. Um, her, you know, a damage or attack speed ones just helps so much mm -hmm. um, for for clearing faster. That even though you're moving faster with move speed Quince, you clear slower um, since you can kill the camp so much quicker. Uh, but yeah, it's it's difficult with the since they nerfed the base base move speed of her anyway. I did want to jump back for a second just to your, your point on the thousand cuts nerfs. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because I know as a philosophy, it's something that they used to want to stay away from because people get frustrated. Oh, I got nerfed again, again. You know, every, every time it pops up, people get very frustrated if the champion that they like to play is in the patch notes, if it's a negative thing. And I, I think that despite that, overall, this is much healthier for the game. And it's so hard to predict where a champion will land when you do a big change, when you, especially if it's in the mechanics of a champion, that this is a way more consistent way to actually get people exactly where you want to go. Yeah, and I also don't like it when people get salty when they go back on a change that was too harsh. Like, 
or nurse someone that's been overbuffed, like Fiora buffs. I hear a lot mm-hmm. of people, I can't believe Fiora is getting buffed already. It's because they went a little bit too hard and they want to correct it while it's still fresh rather than letting it sit there for months on end. I like a more active, balanced team for all champions than one that's afraid of like, oh, we can't change it seven times. We can only change it five times. <laughs> uh, singed when he got nerfed right away. People were like, ah, oh, Singed was bad for so long. No, he got nerfed because he was hilariously overpowered yep. and is still... It's funnily overpowered. <laughs> funnily, not hilariously. It's like a, <laughs> yeah. a soft chuckle, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. As long as they're not uh, constantly switching feel elements back mm-hmm. and forth. Like, if they're constantly moving the move speed around, I wouldn't like that. If they're constantly yeah. moving the ranges of spells around, that would be bad. But when it's just like a few base stats here or a bit of damage on a spell there, those are the ones I like them being finicky with. Yeah, I think the overall philosophy, to me, the best one is to have stages where... Um, I love completely game changing, huge sweeping stuff, um, you know, at the, at the break of the season, or maybe Mm -hmm. like halfway through the season or something like, like that as well. But then, um, it, they, they slowly get, um, you know, more and more, um, minute, the changes basically as as you, as you move uh, either towards like spring playoffs, even Mm -hmm. like we can have, uh, you know, a, a slimming there and then like maybe a big one and then another slimming. Um, I think I think that would keep it healthy because I still love like preseason. I'm juiced, right? I'm like, oh my god, this is gonna be broken. This is gonna be broken. I love theory crafting and like checking the efficiency of all the items and trying to find the you know the basically the cheapest way to gain ELO at the beginning. Kobe, I've heard you say juiced th- two or yeah, three times. Yeah, I was going to say this is a new thing. How, where did you pick that up from? What happened? Was that uh, a, a NorCal thing? Some, someone told me to say it. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Do you lose the bet now because we noticed? I don't know. I have to change the rules or not, but I feel like we're super awkward now. This, yeah, the, this just, plan is blown. I, was, I spend so much time around this guy. I've never once heard him say juice have, in my have whole you, life. Have, never so once. have you watched uh, Super Troopers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know that that one where like they pull over the person. Yeah, oh, and yeah. Have same meow, like the same meow. meow. It's the same okay. thing. Okay. This I'll, is so awkward. I, I think I lost the bet now. I don't even know if it counts anymore. See, I don't think I don't think you won the bet, but I think we won the yeah, bet. Yeah, we just won the so bet. So whatever the stakes are, we get the reward. Yeah, we get. So the here's reward. the thing. Uh, I felt I was I felt too awkward to try and do it during the inner part stuff because like, <laughs> so like basically it didn't really far. So I was like, oh, better go now. I was juiced. All right, well, you want to know what? Juiced about changes. You got one. Yeah, I got one that I'm super juiced about. Yeah. Uh, it is Me the too. vision ping. Oh, yeah. I'm actually so excited for that. So juiced. I think the vision okay, ping stop. is actually <laughs> such a good addition to the game because as many times as I ping, ping where a ward is, like I ping when it gets placed down, you I'll type, type in the chat. People never pay attention to it. My jungler's still sitting there. I'm back pinging them. They think I'm toxic. No, there's a ward there, dummy. I just can't type. So now I have this, and it's going to be great. <laughs> okay. Mm. I'm going to play Scion because you can do 1,200 damage <laughs> with his ultimate at max rank. I know it's probably not going to happen. That tw- three, it went up 300 damage, man. And Scion wasn't terrible before. <laughs> you now get more health from Soul Furnace and you can do Unstoppable on Are you going to do the zombie Scion builds where you go like no. Frozen Mallet and PD and stuff and just punching them <laughs> no. after you die? Uh, I think... Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Cinder Hulk nerfs that came in, yeah. 75 more gold, whether or not it's still a dominant uh, jungle enchant, which I think it will be. Scion jungle, as far as Winyard was concerned, wasn't that far off. He's it, good support, uh, too. It might be kind of like Maokai, a not Maokai esque, uh, and he's unreliable. I want to play him, though. A lot of the win rates for the super low pick rate junglers are wonky as hell, though. Like, Aurelian Soul was like number one for so long yeah. at like a 0.001% pick rate because one guy on his Smurf only is, really is the one it. doing it. Yeah. 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 Um, but but I do think that you should take it to the next level uh, because, yes, you can do 1,200 damage, rank 3, max range of his ultimate, okay. or at, at least the max range Is where the damage AD stops in, in, increasing. I think you should go to it, build comps around people, holding them in place so you can actually hit it because that's the hard thing about science ultimate, right? Hitting the, the long range one late game, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people usually have move speed by then. They have dashes and stuff. You can queue with them. You'll play Vi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. The ult him up straight into the Scion ulti. There you perfect go. combo. I wanted to hear also your guys' thoughts on Orn. It's pretty cool and right. introducing a, a very new mechanic, which to me sounds crazy. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but you essentially can buy items from the shop when you're out on the map, and people can then also upgrade specific items on your character. Yeah. Now, to me, this sounds pretty crazy. I mean, if, if you're if you're starting out there and I get enough gold and now I can just 
bought my hammer and I have an IE or whatever, you know, you have your item completed <laughs> right Not away. Bought. Done. That seems crazy. Yeah. So I don't know too. They didn't give away too much in yeah. the reveal, but there's a certain number of items that you can pay a thousand gold more for, and a few support items you can pay five hundred gold more for with Orn to get super versions of them. So imagine a super death cap that gives two hundred AP. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really really weird, um, and I find it funny how the designer who did Ivern, one of the weirdest champions we have in our game, is doing this guy as well. So. I think it will be cool, but it is so hard to speculate how this will fit into the game. There's also, you can't upgrade every item, so the list of items is actually Infinity Edge, Triforce, Abyssal Mask, Death Cap, Black Cleaver, Sunfire Cape, Redemption, and Locket. So those are the yeah. things that you can upgrade. That others can upgrade exactly. through him. Can he build items whenever he wants for himself? That is my understanding, but I actually do not know exactly how that works. I think they said in it that he can buy out on the field mm-hmm. uh, yeah. whenever he wants. Uh, I do think one of the things that's interesting to me is that um, they said they really wanted to encourage specific synergies between him and others other champions uh, and i always just think that's cool for champion select and, and mm-hmm. you know for strategies like that um you know if you can fit in um a brahm and i don't know if this guy's going to be a support if he's going to be a jungler or like he's, he's, he's supposed be to be top lane. i think he's, he's going to be a top laner his that's what's intended some of the yeah. things start popping out and you're just like connecting lores and you're like hmm that, you know this guy could probably work well with him um as far as like the the item synergies as well I yes, it is weird, but to me, I look at whatever a champion brings to the game. They should allot like a certain amount of power, and mm-hmm. even though he is giving power in a different way, and you have to you know use gold for it, uh, as long as the rest of his kit is balanced around, he's also giving power through these items. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's you know going to be game breaking or anything yeah. like that. It's just like a different take at buffing up his teammates. In addition to, you know, the increased crowd controls and stuff you can offer. And are you talking about the the new mechanic that's increasing CC, right? It's, what is it called? Fractured or yeah, something, something like that. Yeah, something like that, that. But yeah. even just the part where he busts up items, he's adding power to yeah. you in a different yeah. way, too. So I wasn't sure exactly, because that, be that is the new one that is really powerful. Yeah, I think it'll be tricky to balance his laning because you get this scaling advantage because you have Orn on your team. You mm-hmm. now have a thousand more gold you can spend on your max build, even if you're not hitting that, especially if the items are super efficient. So... Uh, I'm really curious, and I agree, like, you can balance it, but whether you'd even want to, because if he <laughs> is balanced around, like, others being able to become hyper gods with him, how weak is his solo lane going to be, right? Because he's not a jungler like Ivern who can just meander around in the jungle and then mm-hmm. buff people up. That's Your how Ivern walks, yeah. I want to play him again, actually. You should. Mikhail's first. Before they nerf Arden Sensor. Because <laughs> oh! after they nerf Arden Sensor, then... Mm, yeah. Maybe but not. It, it's, it's very true, though. If he's supposed to be this guy who... His main role is to increase the power of other people. Oh, I make your CC longer. I, I let you have these new items. But he gets slammed in lane every game. He's not going to be played. We know that's that's how the game works, right? People are not played only to enable others. They have to be able to succeed on their own as well because that's the reality of League of Legends. It does feel to me, if I'm laning against you, if this champion has good enough push, I mean, he has his kind of fire belts and he has all these abilities that seem like they, you could shove waves in pretty well. Mm-hmm. If you could stop your opponent from basing, and be picking up items, and yeah. then look for an all-in. That seems so strong to me. Yep. You know, if I'm up there and I can buy a phage, and you're still on your Doran's blade, and I can just try to all-in you right at six, like, that seems pretty strong. And it seems like it could also be very hard to balance. Yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited for the guy. He's not going to be available for worlds, so we're safe. <laughs> we're safe from but your solo Q death caps. Safe. But your solo key was never safe. Uh, anything else you want to touch on in the patch? I'm good. Anything you use nah, about Kobe? I think we're yeah. good. <laughs> That's going to be a long-lasting one, huh? Oh, yeah. That's months of being juiced for Twitter, things. let's go. Yeah. Uh, promo Wait, tournament what about? Really quickly. Oh, yeah. uh, That's true. Will anyone get knocked out of the promo tournament, basically? I don't think so. I, I yeah. think it seems like the challenger teams probably aren't as strong as they as they were last time around. Mm-hmm. With, with Phoenix gone, I think that's, that's a major yeah. change. But it, it, it's hard to say. I mean, TL maybe isn't as strong now as they were with Doublelift as well. So there's, there's a possibility. But I just think that the level of talent on the teams is still quite high. Yeah, I think it was really close last year, right? Gold Coin made it to, you know, the final best of five to make it in. I think it is it is a higher chance of a challenger team winning than we've had last split. 
I, I, th- I do think that only because like, yes, Liquid is really confident. Phoenix One has lost a lot of games and they've had good things and they, mm-hmm. you know, beat European teams at Rift Rivals or whatever. I think the two challenger teams that made it through are super strong. We got Dandy and Mad Life in this promotion tournament. It's kind of crazy, the investment that's going on in that scene. And it does start on Friday. So it's Phoenix One plays Goldcoin first and then TL plays E United. At the same time, it's, a du- it's double stream. Yeah. So those those are the matches on Friday and then it is kind of the, the double limb. It's the same system that we've been using uh, for a while. And... I mean, do, do you think that anyone could get knocked out, Kobe? I mean, I, it's definitely a possibility. Uh, kind of like, I, I'm not, I'm just not quite sold um, on uh, on the Challenger teams. You know, even though, like, you're, you're talking about, oh, Phoenix has gone too, and, and yeah, Dandy's in here, and I love, you know, some of the names floating around. I just... I, I can't really jump on on the hype train yet. Yeah. I am gonna I am gonna be a bit excited though, and um, I think we're on the first day on the desk together or something yep. like that. So uh, definitely looking forward to to seeing Dandy in, play in North America. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean Dandy That's, and Mad Life, they're champion. big names, but they're also in North American Challenger scene uh-huh. for a reason. Uh, Mad Life got relegated, right? And that was yeah. that was a while ago. So mm-hmm. either way, we'll see how they how they do. Would be very exciting and. I mean, for for TL and for P1, it's got to be very nerve wracking, super stressful tournament yeah. for the players. Everyone's really hoping, not that you want to be eighth, but God, eighth is so much better than ninth or tenth because you don't have to <laughs> yeah. go into this. And for the orgs, oh boy. Twitter questions though, uh, which one do we want to start with? Right here, I'd say from Garrett or Arkham Law. Do you think we will ever see champions like Annie or Shaco again in the LCS? <laughs> Annie to me is just so binary that she's either good or she isn't and that's kind of always how it has felt to me and she hasn't really been in pro play ever since the auto attack nerf range back in the days of at least that that I've seen consistently back yeah. in the days of Doran shield and just any support yeah exactly that was really when it was consistent because she's so short range that when you play against players who don't make mistakes and allow you to all in you just get zoned off the waves you get pushed out you get shoved in and it's if she doesn't snowball, it's really hard. Yeah, and her wave clear is, you know, not the best either. So, like, if you're not, if you're short range and you don't have the best wave clear, and like, your big thing is flashing in for for AOE stuns, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, pro teams are so much better at dealing with, then I uh, definitely tend to agree on that one. As for Shaco, I feel like they changed him more in the direction of not seeing him. They mm-hmm. pushed him even more in the direction of the squishy assassin, um, you know, and he's even more scaling now. When I was hyped up about the changes, I don't know, months ago or whatever, mm. and we were talking about the um, ratio on his shiv now, that you actually have to put points into, which yeah. is a thing where you also wanted to put points into your queue for the longer invisibility early. So he's more towards scaling, more towards this, you know, kind of assassin style, and that doesn't typically find success in pro. Yeah, and I also think for weird picks like Shaco, you need to have a certain number of things happen in your team environment to even allow that pick to flourish. So we saw Moon pulling up from FlyQuest. That was in a time where they were having so much success doing their thing. He got to play Eve. They won, right? High was the only one playing Cassidy. They were able to win with that. And they're like, all right, whatever you think is good, man, you got this. <laughs> and it's so rare that you get a, a freewheeling team like that that is also finding success to pull something like that off. And then the champion still has to actually work in competitive. So... uh I think it'll happen. I think the LCS will be going on for many more years. We will see it, but it's not like something, oh, yeah, right around the corner, man, it's coming. I think you have to get that environment again that FlyQuest had in spring to see it again. Or major changes, right? You know, Annie is a, is a champion that could, you know, see changes in the future. So is Shaco, obviously. But Annie, I can't even remember. Well, I guess she was touched with the Tibbers change a, a while yeah. ago, but that was pretty minor. So, you know, maybe if some there's some adjustments, we might see them in the future. Yeah. Uh, at... Cacti Hong or Cactus Hong. What happens in a game that convinces you to surrender? And what keeps you from <laughs> surrendering? Because you always hear people say, never surrender. You always have a chance to win. Cool. I love surrendering. Sometimes. So do I. <laughs> Yeah. Surrendering is like my favorite thing. Is like, <laughs> oh, your, your favorite, favorite thing? thing? You because get juiced every time you have to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I may be exaggerating a tad bit with 15 my minutes, it's time. Thing, but what makes me want to surrender is so most of the time I actually don't care that much about losing. If I'm going to have less fun in the game, you know, even if I win, right? If there's a small chance that I'm going to win, but I'm guaranteed to not have fun because someone is super toxic, like people like that who are refusing to work with their teammates, who are making the game only about them, I hate playing with people like that. If someone is, you know, 04, whatever, top lane, and they're just spamming you to come gank for them and they're just feeding and blaming you, that sort of thing, 
I would rather give up my small percent chance to win that game and go to a next game simply because I will have more fun and I don't care enough about that. I would say my surrender votes are 100% just team mentality. Yep. Yep. Toxic um, players. If it's a bad atmosphere, you know, if people have been flaming me, I'm the jungler, so sometimes that does happen. Mm -hmm. Even um, though you're perfect. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Azale. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I agree. I think that's 100% of my votes. Yep. Toxic players are, are terrible to play with. Th those are the games I want to surrender. I don't care if I'm losing two kills to 20. Yeah, if no one's saying anything. It's yeah, then you just played out. Because to the to that guy's point, I forgot you try to get his name out, whatever his name Jackie is. Hong. That guy, I think that's a good point. Like, I, you actually can win a surprising number of solo queue mm -hmm. games if you just stay in. Because mm -hmm. remember, it is solo queue, and as many times as you've been on a team where you're frustrated and you guys throw a big lead, that's exactly what the other team, you know, has a pretty high chance of actually doing in solo yeah. queue. And here's one thing, like, I hate the people that try and convince you to surrender. Mm -hmm. In games that I want to surrender, I'll put up the vote once, or I'll ask the team if they want to surrender, and if they don't want to play it out, I'm right, if they do want to play it out, I'll write back in there with them yeah. because I don't want to kind of degrade their experience because everyone has different goals when they're coming into solo queue. One thing that I'm always trying to do, right, is I don't actually look at my division. I just try and improve as a player, which is, I think, the best way to climb long term. But that means when you have like a 2% chance of winning a game and you have a toxic teammate, I'm going to want out of that game because I want to start the next one because I'm going to learn more from my next experience. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the reasons... Uh, Korea re surrenders so much faster because they are on PC bong time and they only have like a finite amount of time they can play. I'm recovering from that wrist surgery, so I can only play so much. <laughs> it's like 10 more minutes of this useless game. That could be 10 minutes of a useful game. Yeah. I need to keep this in there. So You definitely don't want to hold games hostage. I completely agree. If people don't want to surrender, keep going. It's, it is funny, though. I do think you can win a lot more games if, you're, if you have the mentality and you're willing to be a team cheerleader. My brother, when he actually started playing, he had no MOBA experience had really not known that much about League of Legends and his his strategy, and he got to Platinum within a couple months of starting to play. His strategy was literally to be the team cheerleader. No matter what happened, it was, great job, guys, keep it up. We can do this. We'll come back. You know, just, he, he literally <laughs> talked about it. Like, his strategy is trying to be the team mom. And he, he felt he won so many more games because of that where people are being super toxic, but he's just being insanely positive the whole time, <laughs> no matter what. And he could only play, like, two champions and... Probably wasn't platinum skill level, but hey, it worked. It's like yeah. the shock collar for solo queue. Yeah, you definitely want to be positive. Final question. Uh, we're going to end up talking about this, I'm sure, throughout the playoffs, but quick thoughts now from Forecast Winter. Of NA's current top four teams, which have the best chance of doing well at Worlds, what would constitute world success for NA? Quick hits. For, for me, I, I think TSM probably still has the best chance. I think that because they have accrued more experience and some of the guys that didn't show up in the past, Haunter has done a bit better internationally now a couple times. You know, MSI, I thought he was better than he was at Worlds. Riff Ravels, he was great. You hope that it, that experience leads them to international success. And what is international success? I mean, for me, I think I'll be very happy if NA got to semis. That, I think, is, is the benchmark because we almost always get someone out of groups, but you really are looking for, for top four. Almost always. That's one team. I'll go with another team then because I, I think that we'll probably all have TSM in there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think TS, I think what Isaac said is pretty much true. And it was only, what was the year we didn't make it out? 2015, and it didn't make it out of groups. But other than that, there's been someone in quarters. So year. TSM, and then uh, I, I really want to say uh, CLG even after the jungle thing. Before the jungle thing, I, I think it would have been a no-brainer for me. And I've been like, TSM and CLG, you know, right there together. Uh, the jungle hiccups definitely throw a wrench in it because um, most of my security with, with saying, oh, yeah, I think that they're right up there with TSM would would rely on who he's uh, play, Darshan's improvement, and Zix. Yeah. I think that those guys bring so much when you end when you enter international events and Aframu or excuse me, yeah, Aframu as well in the bottom lane, you know, the in-game leadership, all these things. Those guys are all veterans. Now that um, they're trying to bring in a rookie jungler, mm -hmm. It rolls the dice a little bit. I'm still going to say they're in there as well, but yeah. it's much more risky. I would agree with you if they go, but I think it's going to be real hard for them to make it mm -hmm. because Cloud9 and TSM are probably going as like if Cloud9 makes the finals, they're going to go on points or if TSM makes the finals, they're going on points. Then it's a matter of can CLG beat Immortals? Because if they can't beat Immortals, Immortals will get in the third seed uh, and they're going to need to improve sooner rather than later for that. So yeah. going to be really exciting.
That'll do it for this episode of The Dive, though. <laughs> uh, another big thanks to Parth, even though he has been banished to the Shadow Realm for the past discussion because he didn't want to give away secrets. Who would have thought? Thank you, Parth, for coming. Hope we can have him again sometime. Uh, also, thank you for the Twitter questions. Hit us up at RightJat, at RightKobe, at RightIsale. Hashtag The Dive, LOL. Promo tournament starts this Friday, P1 versus GCU, and TL is going up against United.